Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. So if you're able to stand, you can join me and stand on your feet and let's get our hearts together and I'm going to kneel and let's just go before God. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here in the house, Lord, to, to come and to worship you, to draw close to you, Lord, to connect our hearts to you in worship and in praise and to hear your word and desire and path for our lives. God, that we can come into this place without fear of being persecuted is just such a blessing that we don't even understand. So, Father, we thank you so much for the ability to be here tonight. Lord, we thank you that we don't come into this place to hear from a man or to fulfill a ritual or to be entertained, but God, we come to hear from you. We we fully acknowledge that it's Jesus Christ as the senior leader of this church. And so it's in the name of Jesus we ask your Holy Spirit would be our teacher, would be our counselor, would be our helper. Show us things to come, Lord, in the word of God. Remind us of things that you've already taught us. God, I thank you that we would leave equipped, like your word says, to be your church, Lord, that this is for the equipping of the saints. And Lord, we thank you for all that you've blessed us with. You know, at the, church, at the Rock, we never think of ourselves as better than anybody else. But rather, we are co laborers in the body of Christ. So, Lord, we thank you that the, the Inland Empire in its size is something that we could not do alone or reach alone. And, Lord, we thank you that we've got brothers and sisters all across this valley that are reaching and, and teaching the people for the, the goodness of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, Lord, we thank you that we can partner with them in fulfilling your mission and your kingdom's uh, desire, Lord. And so, we thank you that you would bless the churches of the Inland Empire and around the world for that that matter, that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, bless the Calvary chapels and harvests and the grove and Lord, bless churches like the Way and Water of Life, Emmanuel Baptist, the new creation. Lord, we thank you that your hand would be upon them and, and, and we ask that your Holy Spirit would move upon them as you have moved upon us. Lord, bless our Catholic brothers and sisters and all the churches that belong to various denominations. Lord, thank you that we are all diverse but serving one purpose, that is your kingdom. Father, we ask that your hand would be upon Pastor Jim and Pastor Deborah in the next coming weeks for his surgery. Lord, we ask a special prayer that you would guide and lead his doctors and his surgeon on his back. Lord, that every move that that surgeon makes would be inspired by the Holy Spirit. Lord, your word says that if any man lacks wisdom to let us ask in faith, Lord, I pray that you would give wisdom and direction to the doctors overseeing that. I know Dr. Kanga is involved in that this coming week. So, Father, I thank you that you would begin to impart wisdom and direction on their part. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that Pastor Jim would find a new lease on life with his back, Lord, that he would have a youth about him, Lord, that, that you would cause him to be able, that his latter days of his life would be more fulfilling than the former days, Lord. And we thank you, God, that you have blessed a man that has done so much that we are blessed to be here tonight because of him. So, Father, bless him and mom as well, Lord. Cover them, protect them, and we pray healing over his body in Jesus' mighty name. We all said, Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. Tonight we're going to resume what we talked about last night, or last night, <laughs> last Wednesday night. We're going to talk about what we talked about last Wednesday night, finishing strong. And if you were here last Wednesday night, really there was just one essence and it was an encouragement that the, 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 the finishing strong and what really matters most is not how you begin, but how you finish. You know, and sometimes we just need to hear that in our own lives. Sometimes we need to realize that, you know, maybe you're in the place where you've dealt with some issues. Maybe you're in the place where you've fallen back into some mistakes. Maybe you're in the place where your marriage is not what it should be. It's on the rocks or it's fallen apart or literally it's crumbled. Maybe you're at a place where you're looking back at your life, looking at a bunch of decisions and regrets that you've made and thinking, how can I ever move forward or be who God has called me to be or do anything or be anything for the kingdom of God? I'm a waste. But the truth is, is what's really important for you and I to understand is not how we begin, but how we finish. And as long as you and I have a breath in our lungs, as long as we're here tonight, as long as we're listening to the Word of God, as long as we have an opportunity to continue living life, it's not over. And so we left with the encouragement that we can finish strong by getting into Jesus. We looked at Hebrews in the 12th chapter. Hebrews in the 12th chapter, verses number 1 and 2, told us to lay aside every weight and sin that so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. To lay aside, to get rid of, to, to make decisions. Life is full of decisions. What are we going to do? 
What are we not going to do? Who are we going to associate with? Who are we going to listen to? What are we going to allow in our lives? And I love how it ended in verse number two is looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus Christ is the author, the beginning and the end, and the finisher. You see, we still have breath in our lungs, which means we still have opportunity to finish strong. But what it all boils down to for you and I is none of us can finish our lives, our race. Like Paul the Apostle at the end of his life was able to say that I have fought the fight. I have kept the faith. I have finished the race. That we will never be able to say that statement without Jesus Christ. It's not a self-help message. It's not just a course alignment. Well, I've got to do things in my life to, to, do, to do better. I've got to lay aside different things that I know are holding me up. And I've got to work at making myself better. That's great. And if you try it, you'll get somewhere with it. But you won't be who God has called you to be. The only way we can be who God has called us to be is by looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So the encouragement that we left off last week is that you can finish strong. So tonight as we continue, this is finishing strong part two. Really, it's finishing strong part 2.5. Because if you were here on Sunday night, that exactly and directly ties into finishing strong. We talked about fighting temptation. How to get over and beyond temptation. Because temptations are just one of the many things in our lives that hinder us from finishing strong. But did you know that the Bible tells you that you can get over it? The Bible tells you that you're not alone, that God is faithful, that you're able and equipped to endure. So really, this ties into Sunday nights, but if you didn't hear Sunday night, that's okay. Because I'm not going from Sunday night, we're picking up from where we left off on Wednesday night. But that's a shameless plug to listen to Sunday night. <laughs> The takeaway, if anything tonight, what we're going to talk about is finishing strong. If we, if we, if we, if we were to label it or to give it a, a, a thought or a process to say how to finish strong, we can think of it that way. But really, it's not just a how to or how we finish strong. Because if we call it a how to, we'll, we'll spend every Wednesday night for the rest of this year talking about how to finish strong. But really, I want to touch on a subject that I believe covers a great deal or a great portion of our lives. And the subject is this, influence. Influence shapes who we are. It determines who we will become. There's influence in our lives that's used for good, and there's influence in our lives that's used for bad. Maybe growing up you saw your parents and you thought to yourselves, I'll never be like my parents. I won't be like my dad. I won't act like my mom. But as you grew up, as you began to become an adult, you found yourselves thinking or saying things that your dad used to say or, or saying things that your mom used to say or, or your teachers or whatever it might be, somebody that influenced you because you, in influence we catch mannerisms. We, we follow the quirks. You might hang around for somebody for a while and all of a sudden you talk like them. I've used that example before. I have family members that in the, in the way that they speak, I find after the end of the day, my wife's like, when did you get ghetto? And I'm like, oh, I was just hanging around around my family member, you know? <laughs> Influence will shape who we are and who we will become. And who we will become, whether you're 95 years old, you're not done. You're still alive, so you still have room to become something. Influence will shape who we are and who we will become it, when we allow it. And we have the authority. You need to understand this. You've got the authority. I've got the authority to determine who and what and how much I will allow something to influence your life or my life. We have the decision. We have control. We have control over our own lives. But if we don't realize that, if we don't live our lives as though we have control, as though we have the decision to make, then we're going to be influenced by everything around us and we're going to be like the Bible tells us in the book of James, a wave tossed in two, uh, uh, to and fro around the, in the sea, undecided, unwavering, or wavering around because there's so many different things in our lives that, that seek to influence us one way or another. 
But can I tell you something? What it really boils down to, I'll tell you the end right now at the beginning. What it really boils down to is influence. And who should you and I be influenced by? Did you know who the most influential person on earth is? Does anybody know who the most influential human being ever to exist is? Unanimous decision. Does anybody know? Some of you are like, maybe, I don't want to say. It's not Barack Obama. It's not Napoleon. It's Jesus. Jesus Christ has changed more among society than any man on earth. To the very point where time itself is named after him. You may not know that. We live in A.D., which some people say is after death, but it really means the year of our Lord. B.C., or now the scientists, the, the, the atheists have tried to change it to before common era, but it meant before Christ. Literally, the birth of Jesus Christ and the death of Jesus Christ is what separated time. The most influential person who ever walked the face of the earth is who you and I should allow to influence us. But we're often influenced by other things. And today, I just want to talk about finishing strong and talk about areas of influence that in our lives we should guard. You don't have to. It's not mandatory. But I believe that if you look at these areas, if you look at what the Bible says about some of the things that we're going to talk about today in influential areas, and we guard them, we watch or we determine what we allow in also by what we allow out, our lives will be changed. They'll be impacted. We'll begin to reflect and to look like Jesus Christ. We'll begin to act and, and follow the mannerisms of Jesus because who we're influenced by will shape and determine who we are and who we will become. And I know, I know that you want to finish strong. And I know in my own life that I want to finish strong. And so when Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here is an example of a man that finished strong. As a matter of fact, finished stronger than any human being has ever finished before. Why? Because the grave could not hold him. Because death could not stop him. The moment the world said we had his defeat, Jesus Christ rose from the grave and is now seated at the right hand of the Father and seeks to influence you and I through his word, his teaching. His precepts. He's left us, like we talked about on Sunday night, everything we need to, to succeed in life and to finish strong. So three, three simple thoughts are some areas necessarily that, that you and I should guard when it comes to influence. The first area that you and I should guard when it comes to what we allow to influence us in our own lives is us. You. You are influential to you. You're like, dude, seriously? Really? Yes. You know, nobody, I'll say this about me, and I bet you're a lot like me. Nobody can beat me up like myself. I know all my pressure points. I know all my weaknesses. I know all of my own secrets. Some of you are like, dude, that's deep. Nobody can beat you up like you. As a matter of fact, you've even heard the phrase coined. You are your own worst enemy. Remember that movie Bruce Almighty when he's beating himself up and knocking himself out around? That's what we're like when it comes to influence. Because all day long, we have thoughts, you do and I do, that barrage us. Things that tell us that we're no good. Things that tell us that we've made too many mistakes. Things that tell us that our marriage is not going to succeed. Things that tell us that things like Christianity are fake and not real and that we're stupid for even believing it because we can't see it or understand it. Things that tell us that you're not going to do or amount to anything in life. And you are one of the most influential people in your lives you will ever meet. <laughs> Dropped a bomb on you. 
So you may say, man, I I didn't feel like I amounted to anything. You are an influential person. Did you know that? So you can walk out tonight and be like, man, I'm influential. It may be only to yourself, but you're influential. (laughs) And so you got to learn. We've got to learn and to watch what we think, to, to guard what we say about ourselves, what we allow to be processed in our minds. If you've got your Bibles, you can go with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians in the 10th chapter. I hear a couple pages turning. Nowadays you hear less pages turning. That's not a bad thing. It's just because we've got digital, digital Bibles now. So you can take your U version or your whatever it might be, olive tree or all the different Bibles that are out there. so cool that you can do that thumb there. That's a new way to say it. Paul the Apostle in 2 Corinthians the 10th chapter says these words. He says, verse number 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not physical, but are mighty. For the pulling down of strongholds. If you've got, your bi- or if you've got a pen, if you have the actual physical Bible, you can just highlight that word or if you've got a pen or something to mark it with or take your fingernail and just kind of make an indent so it stands out next time you read it. For the pulling down of strongholds. And he goes on and he says, because I'm going to talk about that for a moment. He says, casting down arguments, verse number five. You know, an argument in the Greek, that word translated literally means to be thoughts, subjections or, or ideas, suggestions, arguments, something that is planted, something that you think about, something that you ponder about, something that, that comes up in your mind, an argument. Am I really worth this? Can I really finish strong? Can my marriage really succeed? Can my kids really find God on their own? Casting down arguments against and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Listen to this. Bringing every thought into captivity. That's a really cool statement right there. To the obedience of Christ. I love this. And being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. You see, the thing that we've got to understand is who controls your mind? You do! You're like, man, I don't know. You control your mind. Which means you are in control of your thoughts. Wait a minute, my thoughts just keep coming. But you can tell yourself to stop. You can stop thinking thoughts. Man, I don't know how. But see, what happens is we're barraged day in and day out by things like worry, by things like fear, by things like, you know, thoughts of of how am I going to make it for tomorrow? What's going to happen? I don't know how my bills are going to get paid or, or I don't know about this or how are my kids or how's my marriage or I'm not good enough or I can't do this or I've made too many mistakes or my wife is this or my husband is that. And we are full and full and full of these thoughts that exalt themselves above the knowledge of Christ. But the Bible says, taking every thought into captivity, making it uh, to the obedience of Christ, punishing it by the obedience of Christ, by following after the things of God. You see, you wouldn't be guilty or you wouldn't feel guilty if at 3 o'clock in the morning, Somebody came and banged on your door. And as you looked through the people, you saw a guy with a black ski mask and a gun in his hand. You wouldn't feel guilty for not letting that thought or that person in. If it was a friend or a family member, you'd let them in. But if somebody wanted to do you harm, you wouldn't feel guilty about a robber who wanted to rob you. You'd be mad about it. You'd say, forget that person. I'm going to call the cops. Or if some of you, you'd say, I got something for him when he comes through the door. It's called 12 gauge. (laughs) You'd be mad. But what happens is we feel guilty. We feel bad that a, a, a bad thought came into our mind. Oh, I'm such a terrible person. This this image or this thought came up. Guys, you deal with something that most women in this world don't understand. The visual attraction that men have. And so the the image of a woman that pops up, we say, oh, I'm just a I'm a perv. But you wouldn't be mad if somebody tried to rob your house and you said no. Why get mad because the devil planted a thought? Why beat yourself up because the devil tried to plant a thought in your mind and and you saw it? 
What the difference is, is we have control whether or not we're going to meditate on it, whether we're going to think about it, whether we're going to hold on to it, or whether we're going to put it into obedience through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. This world is planting seeds in our minds of what life should be like. And because of that, we have influenced our own lives to say, we're not good enough unless. We can't achieve anything unless. That we don't look the right way unless. That, that I'm never going to be valuable because. But the truth of the matter is, is that God so loved you, he gave his only begotten son, which means God sees value and purpose in your life. We need to stop listening to what our mind says about us and how bad and how dumb and how stupid and, and how we can't make it. And we need to begin to listen to what the Word of God says about us. To take control. It's not about the seed that is planted in your mind because be assured, the devil, the enemy wants to see your life destroyed. But don't be mad or sad or guilty about something that you thought, stop thinking it. And start speaking what God says about yourself. Start saying the word of God over your life. Things will begin to change because you will influence who you are. So start speaking what God speaks over you. Paul the Apostle in the book of Philippians, in verse number 4, he says, I'm sorry, Philippians 4th chapter, verse number 8, Paul says, Finally, brethren, Whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. That means literally think about these things. Stop listening to the criticisms of your mind. Stop beating yourself up because of what you've done, but start meditating on the things that are good, the things that are noble, the things that are praiseworthy, the things that are just, the things that are of virtue. Start thinking God's thoughts out of the word of God and you will begin to influence your life to say, you know what, I can make it. You know what? I will make it. You know what? I'm going to stop thinking those thoughts about my wife. I'm going to start changing me and not worry about God changing her. I'm going to stop thinking those thoughts about my job. I'm going to stop thinking those thoughts about my kids. I'm going to stop worrying about my money. I'm going to stop worrying about this or about that. Have you ever spent time, days, or weeks worrying about something only to find out when the event has happened or passed? You're like, what was I worrying about? Let's stop wasting our time worrying. Stop wasting our time beating ourselves up. There's enough in this world that beats us up already that we don't need to join in the fight. Let's start spending time meditating, thinking about what the Bible says. Things that are pure, things that are just, things that are noble, things that are godly, things that God says. That's what we fill our mind with. So don't get guilty next time something bad comes into your mind, but replace it with something good from the Word of God. Speak what God says about you. You know, another area that you and I ought to really watch as far as influence in our lives. Another area that we need to pay attention of influence is the influence of others. If the influence of you or the influence of us is, is internal or introspective, the influence of others is everybody or the voices on the outside, if I could say it like that, because we got voices on the inside, you know what I mean? Some of you are like, no, Pastor Luke, well. The voices on the outside, whether they be friends, whether they be family members, Listen, whether it be the television, hello, whether it be uh, uh, the, the, the voice of the teacher that told you that you'll never amount to anything, whether it be the voice of your ex that says that you're a lousy person, whether it be the voice or, or the, uh, the influence of somebody on the outside who said something to you. you. Remember as kids, they taught you that sticks and stones might break your bones, but words will never hurt you. Probably one of the greatest lies we as children ever learn because words carry a lot of weight. I can still remember the, the ninth grade math teacher that told me that I would end up in prison because I wasn't a good student. I remember his face and his voice. But you know, I also remember the teachers in my elementary school that told me that I was pretty smart because they also had influence in my life. 
And so we have a choice. What are you going to listen to? The influence of others is something that we should very much pay attention to. What do you allow yourself to receive? What are you influencing yourself or feeding yourself through society, through the television? You know, there's things on TV that might be very entertaining, but influentially speaking in your life might be incredibly intoxicating or toxic to your life. And you and I have got to watch to guard what we allow to influence us because what influences us will determine who we are and where we will be or what we will be. And the influence of others plays a huge part of that. The Bible says in the book of 1 Corinthians, you're there, I believe, in 1 Corinthians, the 9th chapter. Go to 1 Corinthians in the 15th chapter. Paul the Apostle says these words. He says, don't be deceived in his final or his closing thoughts. Don't be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Did you know that it is physically easier to pull somebody down than it is to pull somebody up? Because gravity is working on your side to pull somebody down. It is exactly the same when it comes to influence. It is easier to get pulled down in life than it is to be lifted up. Why? Because to be lifted up, we have got to make a decision on what we allow to influence us. But to be pulled down, misery loves company. We like to hear it all day long. You know it, I know it. If you've ever hung around somebody that complains all day, you probably know somebody that's like that. I mean, they can find anything to complain about. Man, look how beautiful that sunset is. Well... It's kind of cold outside. That one cloud over there is blocking the view of the mountain. I mean, there's people that can find anything to complain about. And you know it just as well as I know that if you spend enough time with that person, you'll start finding things to complain about too. You'll start thinking the thoughts that they're thinking. Because what we allow to influence us will determine who we are and where we'll be. So if we allow negativity, if we allow the words of the world, if we allow the things of society to determine who we are, what we believe, and the stand that we should take rather than the influence of Jesus Christ, the most influential person on earth, then that will determine who we are. But we're talking about finishing strong. So finishing strong, we need to be influenced by Christ. Paul the Apostle says in the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. What does that mean? Yeah, I I don't even know what leaven is either. A little bit of yeast makes the whole bread rise. Let me say it like this. If I made muffins, oh man, I'm fasting sweets, sugar. (laughs) See, it's the pastries, confections thing. I talked about donuts all Sunday night. If I made a muffin, it's fresh out of the oven. Oh man, blueberry. I mean, just fresh blueberry, like, like, a, like, a, like a Mimi's kind of muffin or those big ones from Costco, you know what I'm talking about? Not those little dinky hard ones, but like fresh and just, oh, hot, steam rising, sugar coated on, oh. I've only had one meal today, all right? If I made you just, oh man, you just smell so good. I said, man, this is fresh. I made it for you. I want you to have this muffin. You would be like all over it, right? Because some of you are like, dude, seriously, I'm hungry. You're, you're, you're scratching where I'm itching. But if then I was to say, listen, I got this muffin. Oh, it's so, so good. But I don't know how it happened. But just, just by, by circumstance, a, a little, tiny, just minuscule, microscopic piece of dog poop <laughs> fell <laughs> in the muffin when I was making it. Would you want to eat the muffin? Even if it was minuscule, even if you couldn't even tell, even if you probably didn't even, well, some of you are like, well, I wouldn't taste it, so I'll take it anyways. No, you wouldn't. A little bit of leaven, he says, leavens the whole lump. Just a little bit. And if we allow the words of others, just a little word, it might be a little word like nothing. You're nothing. It might be a little bit of, it might be a little word like can't. You can't. It might be a little word like failure. You're a failure. A little leaven will leaven the whole lump. Your life might be a whole fresh blueberry muffin, but if you allow that little tiny bit of dog poo, it'll taint the whole thing. But you have control of what influences you because what influences you will determine who you are and where you'll be. 
So we got to watch what we hear from others. We got to guard ourselves. You know, in the book of Genesis, there's a, there's a story in the 26th chapter about Isaac. The Bible talks about it. It's, it's a time of famine. It, there's a famine in the land, a great famine, and Isaac sows into the ground. He plants a crop in the middle of a famine, and the Bible says that God blessed him a hundredfold in the famine. And the people that Isaac was around, that he was dwelling with, that he was encamped with, were jealous, the Bible says, envious of him. So they took dirt and they filled in his wells, his watering holes, the place where he got water. You know, and then Isaac says, okay, well, he picked up and he moved. They told him, you're too, you're, you've grown too much. We don't like you. We're intimidated. So he picked up and moved and he dug another well. And there, the shepherds of that land came and they argued with him and they bickered him about, with him about it. And they said, that's our well, that's our water. And he moved and he moved. And finally, Isaac came to a place that was his. And he dug a well. And the Bible says God blessed it. Sometimes we hang around people that are here just to fill up our wells. That all they do is fill up our well with dirt and rock. You know, you think about it like this. I remember when I was in Bible college, sitting under a great man of God, uh, Brother Hagen, Kenneth Hagen. Kenneth Hagen used to say it like this. We allow ourselves to be vomited on by people all day long. You talk to somebody and you know as soon as you pick up the phone, they're just going to all over you. The bad news, the complaints, the negativity. And after a while, that begins to influence us because who we are influenced by determines who we are and where we'll be. We begin to mimic and act and think and say like they. Sometimes we just need to do what Isaac did and pick up and dig another well somewhere else and make the decision, I will no longer be influenced by this person. I will no longer allow the things that my teacher said about me. I will no longer allow the things that my ex-wife said about me. I will no longer allow the things that, that are going on or what the TV show says I should be. I will no longer allow that to influence me. I'm going to pick up and I'm going to dig a new well somewhere else and I'm going to allow God to influence my life. Sometimes you're in a situation, especially if you're married, and you're, you're, you're married, you say, man, <laughs> I can't pick up and dig another well, Pastor Luke. <laughs> I refer you back to the first one, to guard yourself. Start speaking about you, what God says. Worry about you first. Go somewhere else later on. You can't pick up and dig another well. Start speaking what God says. Stop allowing the negativity the, the, the world that wants to throw dirt in your well-being into your life. Pick up and move. You know, the, 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 the last idea or the last thought of where we should guard our lives is, is really the subject of, of, of influence, is the subject of circumstances. You know, circumstances or events, what's happened to us can define us in our lives. I bet I can ask every one of you, where you were and what you were doing at seven or what is it each? I was seven or it was nine o'clock our time, but around eleven o'clock your time, uh, December or pfft, September eleventh, nine eleven. Yeah. I'm fairly certain that most of you know where you were and what you were doing on the morning of nine eleven. Why? Because circumstances, events, things that happen to us greatly affect who we are. We can allow circumstances to influence us in our lives. It may not just be circumstances of hardships. It may not just be things of misery. Oh, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. I'm in, I'm in, oh, woe is me. It's so bad. It might be seasons of boredom where you've got nothing to do. And because of that, you allow the circumstance of nothing to do on your day off to influence you. It might be seasons of busyness. Maybe your job is so busy right now, and yeah, you're making money and things are good, but you're allowing that season to influence you. And we have a decision on what we allow to influence us. There's been times when my wife and I, we looked at each other, and we look around the house, and with two kids underneath three years old and, and a gajillion toys, we are overwhelmed. And we look at the circumstance, and we say, overwhelmed. <laughs> Look at the house and we say, influenced for the negative, ain't going to do nothing about it. Sit on the couch and turn my brain off. <laughs> we can allow what happened to us, because it really is true, what happens to us influences us. But we can take that and we can allow it to influence us to do something, or we can take that and allow it to influence us to do nothing. 
The decision is wholly ours. And the Bible tells us in, in the book of 2 Corinthians in the first chapter, I'm actually just going to read it out of the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation is a modern vernacular of the Bible. It's, it's a contextual translation versus a literal translation, which means they took the bigger picture and translated it for that. Paul the Apostle says, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through on the province of Asia. He goes on and he says, We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. And he goes on in verse number 9. He says, in fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely on God who raises the dead because we were as good as dead. Verse number 10, he says, and he did rescue us from mortal danger. And he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him. And he will continue to rescue us. Paul the Apostle says, man, I found myself up against a wall. I found myself in a circumstance which I never thought I would even live through. Mortal danger. Few of us can even say that we've been there in our lives. In so much trouble that we literally are probably going to die. Yeah, we've had emotional turmoil. Yeah, we've, we've, we've had uh, you know, circumstances that have changed our outlook on life. But here Paul the Apostle says, I was in so much trouble in life that I literally thought I was going to die. But it taught me to not rely on myself because I didn't have it. But God raises the dead. And it showed me to rely on God. And he rescued us. And he will rescue us again. You see, circumstances will come. Events will happen. We can't stop them. We can't change them after they've happened. We have nothing to do about them, but we can control how they influence us in our life by saying, this does something to d discourage me or this influences me to move forward and trust in God who raises the dead, who rescued me once before and will rescue me once again. You know, the season of November, December, my wife and I, Stacy, we were at each other like cats and dogs. Can I just be honest with you? Being a pastor and being married is like totally not roses and honeymoons, okay? Like, it's real and it's raw. And the month of November, we were just at each other. Little snide comments here and little, you know, quips there and, and, and seasons where we just didn't even want to look at each other and talk to each other. And the kids, you just, you throw the kids in the mix on it and it's just like, ugh. You start thinking those thoughts. I refer you again to the very first thing we thought of. You, our influence. Start thinking these thoughts of, well, man, life would be better. You know, we can allow the pressures of life because Stacy had six jobs in the month of December. All the way from being a real estate agent to a dog breeder to a solar consultant to a full-time mom. Whatever, she, whatever you name, she did it in the month of December. On top of the growing pressures of, 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 of leadership here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center, we had the decision. We could look at the circumstances. We could look at our relationship and say, well, things are heading south. We gave it a go. Lasted longer than Hollywood. Or we could say, I'm not going to allow the present moment. I'm not going to allow the present circumstance. I'm not going to allow the present uh, uh, event to influence my long-term outcome. But I'm going to choose to say what God says. I'm going to choose to look at this and realize that this is more than just coincidence. That yes, we're under pressure, but God raises from the dead. And that yes, the enemy tries to rip my family apart. And my wife and I, we will get together and we will agree, hey, we're going to push through this. We're not going to allow this season of fighting and quarreling and pressure to stop us. We will make it through. And we have a decision to make on what can influence us in our lives. Whether it's our own thoughts, whether it's the words of somebody else, even coming from the television screen, or it's the events that have happened to us or the events that will happen. We have a choice on what we will allow to influence us. And what we allow influence to, to influence us will determine who we are and what we will be. I like what Paul the Apostle says in 1 Corinthians in the ninth chapter. He talks about an athlete and he gives the analogy and he says, don't you know that every athlete runs? They prepare themselves. Everyone runs, but only one person gets a prize. So he says, run to win. Finish strong. The race you are running is the race of your life and only you can finish that race strong. 
And he says in verse number 25, all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. He says, I don't, I'm not like a shadow boxer, one that beats the air. He says, but I discipline my body. I put it into subjection. I, I, I put my body through things so that I will endure. And he goes on and he says, lest I preach the gospel and become disqualified myself. You know what that says? That says, I finish weak. Lest I preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go to the, the last verse, 27. Verse number 20. Thank you. I fear that after preaching to others, I might myself become disqualified. The worst thing we could do is talk about Jesus Christ and how great he is in our lives and not finish the race. Disqualify ourselves. But Paul says, I am disciplined. We have to be disciplined, you and I. Disciplined on what we allow to influence us. Disciplined in our thoughts, putting every thought into obedience, into subjection. Disciplined in what we allow on the outside, the words, the influence of others, those that we spend time with, influence on their discipline on who we spend time with. And disciplined in looking at the circumstance and not reading it for what it is, but reading it for what God is in that circumstance. The redeemer of those who raised, the, raised, the redeemer of those who are dead, who rescued us and will rescue us again. That's why Paul the Apostle in Philippians in the fourth chapter, verse number 13, you know it, I know it. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. After he just talked about learning how to go hungry and be full, how to have money and how to have nothing, how to be content in all situations, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because what it all comes down to, like I said in the very beginning, is what are you influenced by? And I challenge you to get influenced by the most influential man who ever walked this earth, Jesus Christ. Nobody can make you Nobody can force you. And as much as you get into Jesus is as much as you get out. The more you get into Jesus, you can say, well, I got Jesus and I'm happy with it. That's what you'll get. But the more you get into Jesus, the more you'll get out of it. And that's when our lives will change. And we can finish strong because it's not how we start. It's how we finish. Amen. And we can finish strong. Did you guys get something out of the Word of God tonight? Amen. Hey, listen, really quick before we leave, I want to honor your time. We only have a couple of minutes. I want to just do something. I want to just ask you to give me just a moment more, a few moments more of your attention. And let me just ask you a question and ask you to do something. I want you to just look in your heart, look in your life and answer this question. If you were to die and you were to go to, if you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? If you were to leave right now and die, boom. Would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? Simple question. And how you answer that question has a lot to say with your position with God. And tonight, I don't want to spend a lot of time convincing you or telling you. Simply put, if you're under the impression that you can get to heaven because you want to, because you think so, because you're a positive person, you can't find it there in the Word of God. You're not going to get to heaven that way. If you're under the impression that because your parents had you christened or baptized as a child, that because you attended church as a kid or you're here tonight, that you're going to get into heaven, I respect you enough to tell you the truth, you're not going to make it. If you think that you're going to get to heaven because you went to Sunday school or Sabbath school classes, because you've given yourself the label. We like to label ourselves in America in our day and age. You've given yourself the label as a Christian. Well, I'm not a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Muslim, so I guess it means I'm a Christian. If you think that that's going to get you into heaven, listen, you're not going to make it. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents told you, because you sit in church, because you've even gotten involved. Maybe you're involved in the children's ministry or, or the youth ministry or maybe at your last church you sang in the choir. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you attend church, because you were involved in church, because your parents told you you were a Christian, because you're a positive person, you're going to get into heaven. You can't get to heaven that way. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're a good person, because you give to the Red Cross, because you, you do more good in your life than you do bad, you try to help out your fellow human being as much as you can, you don't speed on the freeway, you've never robbed the 7-Eleven. Do you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're a good person, you're going to get to heaven? You know, the Bible tells us, though, that our good deeds according to God's righteousness are like filthy rags. Nothing we could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough. 
You see, it has nothing to do with how good we are, with how many works or actions or things we do on the outside, with our labels or with what our parents have told us. It has nothing to do with whether or not we've got a cross or St. Christopher around our neck. It has nothing to do with whether or not we've been in church for a day or for our, all our lives, but it has everything to do with our hearts. You see, the only way you and I can get to God's heaven is God's way, and that's through Jesus. Jesus said that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through him. So today I want to give you the opportunity to examine your heart, to examine your life, and to see where you stand, and to make an adjustment and a correction in your life should you need to. You see, Jesus in the book of John was talking to a man by the name of Nicodemus, a religious leader, a man like doing all the things that we described, a man who was involved in his church, the synagogue, a man who memorized scripture, a man who did the right things and gave to the poor and, 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 and helped out the sick, a man, a man who lived a good life. And you would think that when they talk about the subject, when Nicodemus asks Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? You would think that Jesus would just say, man, you just keep doing what you're doing. But Jesus says these words, you must be born again. Sometimes we think of what Hollywood, society, and, and sitcoms have made out of that word, weirdo, crazy, out of control, Christianity. But from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing in the heart and the eyes of God. It means this, that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. Listen, it's an all or nothing relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You could know all about Jesus. You could know all the facts. You could even know the words that he said. But you can miss out by not knowing him. I know the President of the United States, but I don't know him personally. You could know all about Jesus, but miss out on that personal relationship that God desires of you and I. You see, the Bible tells us in Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, Jesus himself is speaking to the church and he says, I'm coming back, he says. And Jesus goes on and he says, but when I come back, I'd rather find you hot or I'd rather find it that you're cold. Because he goes on and he says, if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Whew! Shocking statement from the mouth of Jesus. And you see, what Jesus is saying is that lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all. They'll be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Counted as waste. What does it mean to be lukewarm with Jesus? What is that word? We don't use that very often. Lukewarm simply means in terms of your relationship. That you've got your ups and your downs and your ins and your outs. You're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. Doing some of your thing, doing some of God's thing. You kind of got one foot in church, one foot in the world or outside. You're riding the fence. You know that's an uncomfortable position to be in. And God says, that's not what I desire of you. And listen, I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough to tell you the truth today. That if that's you, you're not going to make it. God forgive us in the churches of America for hundreds of years we've watered it down because we've been more interested in the number of people in seats rather than the condition of those souls. But listen, I love you enough and more importantly I respect you and God enough to tell you the truth. You can't get to heaven your way. You can't get to heaven some well-meaning church committee's way. The only way we can get to heaven is God's way and that's through Jesus Christ. Jesus says these words, if you confess him before men, he will confess you before his father. He goes on and he says, but if you deny him, he will deny you. Today I want to give you the opportunity to make a decision. You see, God respected you so much that he gave you a free will choice. God in his creation could have made us all to follow after him, to make all the decisions that he directed it and called us to do, but God gave us a free will decision to choose to accept or to reject the gift of God. The Bible tells us that the gift of God is eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. It's a gift for us to accept, but you've got to make the decision. And today I want to give you the opportunity in just a moment to make that decision. And in the words of Jesus, to accept him before men, I'm going to do this. I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and the count to three. I'm going to go three and smack my hands together. And if that's you in this place, you say, man, I don't know about my position. I don't know where I stand. I want to challenge you in just a moment to do something. I want you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to go forward in my relationship with God. I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. You see, I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. I won't embarrass you, but even if you were embarrassed, I'm going to encourage you, get over it. Why? Because it'd be a lot better to spend a moment of embarrassment than an eternity in hell because you couldn't go forward for God in a warm, welcome, and loving place like the church. You see, the decision's yours. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. He's not going to force his way or, or make his way in. He's a gentleman. He's respected you enough to give you the decision. He loved you and I so much that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die a beaten, bloody mess for our sin and our shame on the cross so that we could be reunited with him. And his desire is to give all of our heart, all of our life to him through his son, Jesus Christ. 
So today, if you've never given your heart, you've never given your life, in just a moment, if that's you, get ready. Pop your hand up. Maybe you're in this place and say, man, I'm not sure. You know, I did this as a child, or I prayed that prayer once in the youth group, but I never really followed through. Or I was at a harvest crusade one time, and I made that decision, but I never really followed up with it. If that's you, in just a moment, get ready. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. If you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, listen, you've been playing games with God, and you know it. You've been playing church on Sunday or on Wednesday, but then the rest, of the, the rest of the week you're doing your own thing. Listen, it's time to quit playing games with God. You've had doctors and dentists and DMV appointments. Right now is a divine appointment between you and God. This is a decision between you and God and you and God alone. The person beside you, in front of you, behind you, doesn't matter. Right now, you and God. From the front of this auditorium to the back of this auditorium, wherever you're at, you guys in the family room, I can see you through the windows. Maybe you're out in the foyer, foyer and you hear the sound of my voice. If that's you, or even at home, watching online on your computer or your digital device, if that's you, in just a moment, get ready. This is your moment. This is your time. Wherever you're at, it doesn't matter if you've been in this church for an hour or 25 years. What matters is the condition of your soul. Today is the day of your salvation, but it starts by making the decision to follow Jesus. If that's you in this place, you're not sure, make sure. You've never given him your heart, get ready. We're going to count to three. If that's you, if you've been living your own ways and doing your own thing, running from God instead of to God today, make this the day you go forward in your relationship with God. Get influenced by the most influential person on the face of the earth, Jesus Christ, and finish strong the race is set before you. It starts by making a decision. That's what you're doing today. So I'm going to count to three in just a moment. If that's you, get ready. Pop your hands up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down and we'll go forward together from there. You ready? All across this auditorium, front row, back row, doesn't matter. If that's you, get ready. This is your moment. This is your time. I'm going to count to three. Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. Where are you at? You say, man, I want to give my heart. I want to give my life. I see you, my friend. One wise person. Where are you at in this place? Two, I got you back there in the back. Three, I got you back there. Three wise people. Anybody else in this place today say, oh, I got you, my friend. I see you. Three wise people. Four wise people. Anybody else You say, man, I wonder if I should. You should. Hey, come on. Quit playing games with God. Stop messing around and go forward in your relationship with Jesus Christ. It starts by making the decision. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else in this place today? You say, I want to do that today. I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. Well, praise God for the four wise people. Hallelujah. It's good. I believe that there's more. I can't make you. I can't force you, nor would I want to. It's your choice. But for the four of you that raised your hands, or for those of you that didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have. You know where you're at. Only you know where you're at. I want to encourage you. In just a moment, we're all going to stand. And as we do, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible. A friend, if you need a friend, you said, I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Jesus. Now it's time to follow through. I want you to get out of your seat and get into the chair and come meet me here at the altar. We're going to change destinies together, you and I, right here, right now. So if you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, bring a friend. Look to somebody and say, hey, go with me or I'll go with you. And get out of your seat, get out of your chair and come meet me right here in the aisle. Come on, let's all stand together, please. Nobody leave as they come. But if that's you, this is your moment. This is your time. Come on. Let's change destinies together. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I belong to you. You're the reason that I live. You're the reason that I breathe. Jesus, I believe Jesus, I belong to you. Praise God. You're the reason that you guys came. Hey, listen, you're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. Today's the first day of the rest of your life. Awesome. Awesome to see you. Here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here? His name's Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really cool guy. He's going to take you guys just right over there. Nothing weird goes on, okay? I'm as weird as it gets. He made it through me, okay? He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus to be the Lord and Savior. We'll say it like this, the leader of your life. Secondly, he's going to give you some free information, some real easy reading. You walk out of this place, you say, what do I do next? We're going to help point you in the right direction. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back. Hang out with us. We want to get to know you. We want to connect you with a friend here in church that will 
sit with you, to buy a cup of coffee, sit down with you, or get you a soda, or whatever it is. Teach you some things about the Word of God right before church to get you strong in the ways of God. Like you go to the gym and you get a personal trainer. We call them spiritual personal trainers. Somebody that will meet with you for a couple of weeks to get you strong so you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from. But you go forward in everything that God has and you finish strong because it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And you guys are making the right choice right now. So if you guys just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Joel. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.